Thank you very much. We'll move on to the regular daily press brief. Today, Secretary Kerry Metten Laos, with his counterparts from the 27 member ASEAN Regional Forum and the 18 member East Asia Summit. The foreign ministers discuss shared priorities and key challenges facing the Asia Pacific region, including North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile programs, as well as the situation in South Sudan are in the South China Sea, apologies. In addition, the ministers discussed a range of important transnational challenges, including terrorism and violent extremism, climate change, and trafficking in persons. The foreign ministers also discussed specific actions to combat illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, as well as ongoing concerns regarding the degradation of the marine environment. At meetings today, several ministers, including Secretary Kerry, highlighted the significance of the recent decision of the, of the tribunal in the Philippines versus China case, which is binding on both parties. Secretary Kerry also emphasized to his counterparts the importance of the full implementation of the UN Security Council Resolution 2270 to curb North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile programs. The meeting concluded. Secretary Kerry and his party continues on to Manila for meetings with President Duterte and other senior Philippine officials. Next on Somalia. We condemn the terrorist attack this morning in Mogadishu, which took place near the international airport. Civilian UN Amazon casualties have been reported, yet we have no final confirmation on numbers yet. We extend our thoughts to the families and friends of the Somali people in the United Nations and Amazon personnel who were killed and injured in this barbarous attack. We remain committed to helping Somalia progress towards a path towards peace and prosperity in the defeat of terrorist groups, including al-Shabaab. Finally, we would also like to extend our condolences regarding the horrific terrorist attack today at a Catholic church in Normandy, France. We offer our condolences to the family and friends of the murdered priest, Father Jacques Hamel, and our thoughts and prayers with the other victims of the attack, as well as the parishioners and community members at the church. The United States and France have a shared commitment to protecting religious liberty for all faiths. Today's attack will not shake that commitment. We stand with the French as they move forward in their investigation. And with that, we'll go to Abigail. Do you have any information about reports of a shooting uh, in a shopping mall in Sweden? I do not, actually. Is that happening now? There was a, re a, a warning put out on the embassy website. Okay, so that would make message. sense that a security message has gone out. As you know, when we do security messages for U.S. citizens overseas, it's often breaking news like that. Um, and it instantly goes to U.S. citizens who have registered. So I, I take the opportunity again for those who travel and work abroad, please do register Register with the STEP program at travel.state.gov. In terms of this latest incident, I don't have details. Russ? Now, can we uh, talk about uh, what's happening in South Sudan today? Of course. Uh, Rik Mashar has been uh, basically kicked out of the government and someone who had been the mining minister has been replaced. Is this helpful towards trying to establish unity within the government and across South Sudan writ large? So I'll, I'll back up and, and provide a little context for this okay. because um, these events are taking place rather quickly. Mm -hmm. So Taban Dangai, the former Minister of Mining, as you noted in the transitional government, was sworn in as the first Vice President on July 26. Um, on July 25th yesterday, President Kiir did issue a Republican decree replacing former Vice President Mashar with Taban uh, Dengai. Mashar has stated that he rejects Taban's selection as his successor and has requested that he be removed from his position in the SPLM um, IO in opposition as well as the transitional government. However, we would note that the peace agreement contains procedures and requirements that govern changes in leadership in the transitional government. Specifically, the agreement provides that, and I quote, the top leadership body of the armed opposition mm -hmm. has the power to nominate a new first vice president if the position is vacant. A number of senior SPLM IO in opposition members in Juba met on July 23rd and agreed that Taban would take the position of first vice president. However, they also recommitted to implementation of the peace agreement and rebuilding IO unity. Other IO leaders have contested whether the group can act 
is the top leadership body. They've also contested whether the government can relieve Mashar of this position under the agreement. So what I would say on this is there were provisions within the peace agreement on mm -hmm. this. The government writ large, both SPLM in government as well as in opposition, remains in dialogue. We mm -hmm. see that the president has issued a decree on this. Mm -hmm. um, the United States writ large um, stands with the people of South Sudan. We will work with the government of South Sudan. In terms of this and whether it's allowed under the peace agreement, it's going to be a question for the leadership of South Sudan. Does the U.S. believe that uh, the government is operating in good faith with the replacement of Mashar with uh, Mr. Uh, Taban? We believe it's up to the leaders of South Sudan to decide on their, on their political leadership. Uh, we do expect, however, the transitional government and all parties to take every step possible to avoid the fighting and to reach a peaceful resolution of these differences. Is there uh, any uh, input or guidance that uh, U.S. officials are providing to all sides in South Sudan right now? I wouldn't say guidance. I would say that we remain in discussion with all parties. You know, our, our fundamental concern is peace and stability in South Sudan. You know, what we've seen is this recent spate of violence has increased the suffering of the people of South Sudan. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm told 40 percent of whom uh, face hunger. You know, this this latest spate of violence, this this political um, situation now, does not add to the stability which the people of South Sudan so uh, clearly need. Turkey. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my first question is: uh, Last week, U.S. government. Uh, uh, stated that uh, received documents from Turkey regarding extradition process for the Fethullah Gülen, and uh, you are going to take a look whether this uh, can be qualified as an extradition request. Mm -hmm. uh, are you? Uh, have you made uh, that decision yet? I have no update on that. As as we mentioned last week, and I I believe we touched on this week too. We have received documents. We continue to review them. So I have no update on that. The Turkish Foreign Minister uh, Çavuşoğlu today stated that uh, they have, even though they already submitted necessary documents to U.S. government, they have not responded to that yet. Do you have any particular response to that comment? I wouldn't, you know, I'd let the Foreign Minister's comments stand, but I would say that, as we've said, the extradition process is a formal process, it's a legal process, it's a technical process, it's governed by the extradition treaty that both our governments signed. So we're going to let that process play out. Okay. And another question after the coup, uh, I haven't been able to ask this question. But yesterday, there is a new arrest warrant for 42 journalists. And there are more. This, this 42 journalists only just yesterday. In numbers and, for example, there are 19 journalists uh, arrest warrants for 19 journalists in Antalya, South City, and there are other cities similar uh, warrants. Uh, are you concerned that uh, after the coup attempt, uh, government is moving to basically go after the critical voices and news uh, journalists? Uh, along with the uh, coup plotters or allegedly coup plotters? Well, I'd say what we've said repeatedly. In a democratic society, critical voices need to be encouraged. They don't need to be silent. We have said many times, not just in relation to Turkey, but countries around the world, that democracies become stronger when they let voices um, from diverse points of view uh, speak. I'd note, and the President has spoken to this himself, we've conveyed both publicly and in private conversations with our Turkish friends and allies the importance of protecting freedom of the press. You know, we are committed to defend freedom of the press, media freedom, due process, freedom of assembly um, everywhere in the world. So in terms of in this context, are you concerned with this ongoing uh, campaign of arrests for Turkish journalists. So what I would say is that we've actually spoken to this. The president spoke to this um, and, and we'll let his comments down. The uh, travel warning uh, notes that yes. uh, the voluntary departure of relatives of those working for U.S. Embassy and consulate personnel has been authorized. Mm -hmm. What has changed in the last several days since it does seem that, for better or worse, Prime Minister, uh, President Erdogan has a firm grip on power? Why is it not safe for the relatives to stay? 
Okay, so it's, it's important to differentiate on this. This is an authorized departure. So this is an authorized departure. I think many of you saw the travel warning that went out. Mm -hmm. It's an authorized departure for our embassy in Ankara, as well as our consulate in Istanbul, for the family members mm -hmm. of the U.S. personnel stationed there. This is a precautionary measure. It does follow the July 15th attempted coup. Um, we continue to monitor the security developments there. And as we have information, of course, as we are obligated to do, we will share that with the American public. But again, this is an abundance of caution. And, and again, this is optional. So this is authorized. This is not ordered. Yes, ma'am. On the uh, attack on the Catholic Church in France Horrific. and the murder of the elderly priest, mm -hmm. Last year, the German news weekly Der Spiegel published an analysis of Daesh, which was a leak from German intelligence. And it said that Daesh was created in Syria as the regime there in 2012 began to lose its grip, and that Daesh was established by former Iraqi intelligence officers in Syria, and then they took it back into Iraq. And the Kurdish leadership in and out of government has said pretty much the same. Like, President Barzani's media advisor in 2014, quote, most of the people in the region believe that the organization known as ISIL is actually founded and ruled by the Ba'ath. Is that an analysis that you would agree with or you have a so different view? So you're asking view? me to comment on a leaked German report. Well, I'm at, okay, let me say, how do, you under, how do you understand the structure of this organization, which has murdered so, this priest, sure. ISIS or Daesh, or how do you understand its structure? Who's ruling it? You know, I, I would say that there's um, been books written about, about the, what Dash is, the structure of Dash, how they continue to adapt and change. You know, certainly from this building, while the history of Dash and where they came from, you know, the rise of, of Dash and, in fact, violent extremism writ large in ungoverned spaces is something that we talk about a lot. I think where this building is and where our counterparts are in the interagency is how do we fight them as they continue to adapt? You know, and where is the commitment in the international community to combat Daesh? And so you saw this last week, and we spoke about it earlier this week. You see, I think we're now at 67 countries and international organizations have joined around the world to, to combat Daesh. I'm not going to speak about where they started or what their foundation was, but, but really what we're very focused on is how they're adapting and how we can adapt to mitigate that risk. Don't you think it's helped? You know, Sun Tzu know the enemy to yeah. understand Dash, that to fight Dash most effectively, one should understand what it is? Oh, absolutely. And, and I agree with you on that. And also, you know, taking a look at how they continue to adapt and change. You know, we've spoken many times from this podium, too, that as the amount of territory that they control in Iraq and Syria shrinks, that we do see these attacks that are don't require coordination. They don't require a lot of resources. And also, frankly, we have discussions about what it means for attacks to be inspired by Daesh or, or maybe directed by Daesh. You know, this is a very fluid, um, I would say, security.